Let us go to the word, Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. God is? Yes, naturally. God is perfect. All right. God is perfect. Um, his being is uh, perfect. His attribute is perfect or attributes are perfect. His character is perfect. His will is perfect. His power is perfect. His deeds, his works are all perfect. Psalm 18 verse 30 says, as for God, his way is perfect. The, lo the Lord's word is flawless. Another word for perfect, flawless. So his word is perfect. His way is perfect. So there's nothing lacking, nothing incomplete, nothing flawed about God. And therefore, he receives, the, he receives sacrifice or service that is perfect. Hebrews 10 verse 8 says. So given that God is perfect, all that he is is perfect. He only receives the service that is perfect. And he lets those whose walk is perfect or blameless to minister to him. Psalm 101 verse 6 says, My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, and they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to him, to me. So in English, there are many different words to describe this perfection of God. He's perfect, blameless, flawless. All these things indicate who God is. And therefore, God says, if you want to minister to me, you also must be blameless, perfect, and flawless. So faith means to believe that God alone is perfect. How many of you believe that? God alone is perfect. Amen. Of course, you will hear this from a lot of people. You try to preach to them or it's sort of like a way out of one's mistake. They go, oh, oops. Well, God, nobody's perfect. People like to say that, right? Nobody's perfect. So it's sort of a, like a, a free pass to, um, to make excuse and get out of the consequence of their poor, you know, decision or action. It's way more than that. It's to acknowledge and fall before the only perfect one, and that is God. But step further, there's more to that. That faith means to believe that one has been, that you have been made perfect by the perfect God. You have been made perfect by the perfect God. Um, and I'm going to explain that, of course. So through the perfect one, I am made perfect spiritually. So that's what faith means. And if you have that faith, you have to live every day of your life according to this faith, making decision, taking every step according to this faith that is to um, continue to go unto perfection. Hebrews 6, 1 says, let us go unto perfection in New King James Version. Uh, but in NIV it says, taken um, form to maturity. And I'm going to explain. Perfection and maturity have the same meaning uh, in the Bible. So to go unto perfection means to go unto maturity. And to do that, one must continue to obey until obedience is completed. Until obedience reaches perfection, we must continue going on to finally go before the perfect God. How many of you want to go before God in that day? In that day. After my death, after resurrection, I want to go before God. Amen. And that God is perfect. And only those whose walk is perfect can go before him. Yeah, this is where you should lose confidence. Like, oh, I, I, I don't know. Because I'm not. I'm not. So what does perfect mean? Um, obviously, you know the meaning. In, in, uh, in English, it means without flaw or fault, without defect. Uh, it also means complete. So it's not 50% or 99%. It's what? 100%. It's meeting the 100% requirement. That's what perfection means. Perfect means. So there's nothing lacking, nothing limited. It also means maturity. So when... A grain is forming, or a, a, a whole grain or wheat, it has to be full. That fullness to maturity is the definition of perfect. Um, so the passage we just read, as Jesus said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, the Greek word there is teleioi, 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 and it comes from teleios, the adjective, um, having reached its end. So that's what it means. So literally, having reached its end. So to be complete. That's what that means. So in English, again, perfect. Whatever your understanding of perfect means, you need to sort of like look at it slightly different. Like to be complete. Um, and complete in all its parts. There's nothing missing. It's, having, it's to have grown fully, a full age, reaching full age to that fruit. 
so in, in, in growing crops, it's bearing that fruit that's fully grown, not halfway, not three, uh, two, uh, two thirds or three quarters, but it's fully grown. And for the Christian, it means the character reaches that fullness, that maturity. Um, one expl another explanation of this notion is uh, the word teloios comes from uh, the root tel, tel, uh, and that's to reach the end as in, um, you know, the old pirate's telescope, like that it's short, but then you can extend it out to see far. So that extension to all the way to the end is what will allow you to see the object in distance. If you only extend it short way, you can't see. So it's a telescope. It's extending fully out. And when it's fully out, then you reach your goal. So that's what perfection means. So when Jesus says, be perfect, therefore your heavenly father is perfect. Even though we like to accuse people, other people are being perfectionists. Because um, they, they drive you crazy. Right? Perfectionists drive themselves crazy and drive others crazy along the way. Uh, because they want to get it right. So they want to get it right. Um, but there really is no uh, perfection. It's just the attempt to do so. Some, many people give up. Not even 10% into the game, right? So it means people who are putting 200%, uh, staying up all night and like just doing, just going overboard, like overdoing overboard everything because they tend to not trust themselves. So they do, they do say, psychologists say that people who acknowledge themselves or find themselves to be imperfect or insecure tend to overdo it. They overprepare. Whereas people who are incompetent, but they don't know that they're incompetent, so they don't prepare. I know it sounds kind of like strange, but it is true. Like, so they end, end up overestimating themselves. They're like, I got this, I got this. So maybe it's sort of like the um, the grasshopper. No, the, it's the tortoise and tortoise, tortoise and the hare. The, the turtle and the hare. The hare is like, yeah, I could I could jump this. I could go this way really fa fast. So I'm gonna take a nap. I'm gonna relax, uh, and then. Um, the one who is slow actually puts extra effort and then he wins the race. So um, the lesson is that you need to prepare and you need to do your best. Um, even so, however, uh, what the Bible tells us is that no one is. No one is perfect except God. Um, we can see that with Noah. Um, he was described in Genesis 6, 9 as blameless. He is, he, he is a blameless, uh, Noah was blameless in the eyes of God. So blameless. You have nothing to blame that guy because he is perfect. That's what it means. So God um, chose him and told him about the, uh, the deluge that was coming on the whole world to judge uh, the world and drown the entire earth. Um, so he carried out um, the instruction of God by, uh, by building an ark for himself and his family. And it was just he and his family and the animals inside the ark who were saved from that uh, destruction by uh, deluge. But after the deluge, um, they come out to a new earth um, it, it, of cleanse of all the evils. And there's nothing there, nobody there. And it's just new beginning. Um, Somehow, oh, he gives, uh, you know, sacrifice to God and thanks. And then some, at some time, uh, at some point, he um, grows grape, grapes, right? Vineyard, so vineyard. And then he gets crop from the vineyard. And what does he make? He makes wine. And what does he do with the wine? Jesus drank wine, right? <laughs> so we're going to, everybody drinks wine. Well, he drank wine. He helped himself to wine. And he got drunk. And he got drunk naked. Right, so he got drunk. Maybe it was hot. I don't know. So he just took off all his clothes and he's drunk. That sight must have been quite a, quite a, interesting. So one of his sons saw them. Like, oh, MD. so then he told his uh, the brothers, and the other brothers were respectful for his father, their father. So they did not see him naked, but they put covering on Baba. And then Noah woke up and he was very upset. He was upset about this son who had seen his nakedness and told the other brothers. And then out of his anger, he curses that son and his descendants. So that tells us, even though Noah was fine to be blameless in the eyes of God at one point, he really was not blameless, right? Moses was chosen by God to carry out this great work of the Exodus. And he was a humble and gentle man. Uh, and he obeyed the word of God. 
But at one point, as we read in Numbers chapter 12, he takes a wife, additional wife, first additional wife, <laughs> additional wife, another wife who was not uh, a Hebrew of Israel, but rather she's a Cushite woman. So Cushite is like modern day, I think it's Sudan or sort of North um, Africa, the Horn of Africa from that region. So he takes a woman who is Gentile. Now remember, gen taking a Gentile or having relations with a child is forbidden under the law. But here is Moses taking a Gentile woman, and because of that, his sister Miriam uh, and the brother Aaron started talking about it. So they were very upset. So they were complaining. Um, so you would think that God said, how dare you? Um, and, you know, I'm going to punish, um, how, I'm going to punish uh, Moses. You're right. You know, Moses done an evil thing. But actually, it was uh, Miriam who got punished, Right. So then you kind of think like, what? That doesn't make sense. Because uh, in the same book, Numbers 25, we see the occasion where the Israelites were committing sexual immorality with Gentile women and worshiping their um, gods. And there's an incident where an uh, uh, Israelite man uh, was with a Midianite woman. And in their indecent act, a priest went in with a spear, whew, such graphic detail, and ran through the man's heart and the woman's stomach, killing them. Wow. Yes, it's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible because this was forbidden. And that was a lesson. And it actually stopped the plague that came to punish the people of Israel because of their uh, sexual immorality, sin against God. David uh, was a king of Israel um, who is very well loved even to this day. His descendants really love him. And they even have the Star of David and their flag for the people of the nation of Israel. He was well loved by God, actually. And he was a very loyal, um, humble servant of God, yet very flawed man. Uh, he took his, uh, one of his loyal servant's wife. Uh, one day out the window, he sees this beautiful woman taking bath. It's just like, how did that happen? But anyway, so he's looking at the... <laughs> Anyway, so she sees a woman who is taking bath at night and he just looks beautiful. And then he gets, he has, sent, he, has uh, he sends his servants to bring her and he sleeps with her and then she becomes pregnant. So to cover up all this, he finds out that she, she happens to be married to one of his very loyal, faithful servant. Uh, and then he tells his general and said, hey, in the battle that's coming tomorrow, you send that man into front line. So then in his mind, he's thinking, he's, this man's surely going to get killed. And nobody needs to find out what happened. So that man is killed. Uh, and then he thinks that he's okay. But it's through the prophet um, uh, that God speaks to rebuke him. To, um, to bring um, this to light that God knows all. How dare you have lied and you have killed an innocent man who happened to be very loyal to you. So they lose that baby uh, and, and David goes into this very painful uh, repentance. And you read about that in Psalms. In many Psalms, he's reading, uh, he's, he wrote um, these beautifully but very painfully written um, you know, writing or Psalms or prayers and praise to God who is, who alone is perfect, that even though he's, uh, very, he was very loved by God, that he was very flawed uh, man. So the lesson is that no creature is perfect because God alone is perfect. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. But not only that, the perfection, there is the perfection, there is perfection of creation, of the created. So let's go to Ezekiel 28 and read about that. Ezekiel 28, verse 12 to 15. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the seal of, you are what? The seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, crystallite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. So these buzzwords, important words should be sticking out, highlighting, which is that you were uh, anointed. So you, here it says you were 
uh, the seal of perfection. Who is God talking about? This is God speaking of a creature because it says you were created, right? So we're talking about not God, but a creature. But this creature sounds like maybe it was a king, a human king. But no, it says you were anointed as a what? A guardian cherub. A guardian cherub is an archangel. An archangel. So an archangel is an, one of the angels who is a leader of a unit of angels who were made before um, the material world was made. So before humans were made, before animals or before anything in this visible material world was made, there was a spiritual heaven in which God made, uh, in which he placed angels whom he created. So there are angels who are made to serve God. And in this angel in particular, God made him very beautifully. Because if you think about these precious stones, they are precious because they're beautiful. They are uh, very valuable. And this creature is described that way because he was made beautifully with beautiful talents. So he is described to be the seal of perfection. And it says, you are blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. So, uh-oh, something did go wrong with this uh, guardian cherub. Who was this guardian cherub? When he was a guardian cherub, what was he named? Luciel. Luciel, beautifully made, and the, like the name, he was um, luminous. He was br brilliant, beautiful, and talented. But he became wicked one day. So creatures uh, are made uh, to not be lasting per in perfection, but wickedness is going to be revealed one day. Now, why is that? Because of this seal of perfection, where it says he was perfect in his ways or that he was a seal of perfection. God is not saying this angel was perfect in the way God is. Rather, the perfection of the creation is that. We're not talking about stars and the moon or the animals, but we're talking about spiritual beings or humans who have this character, this persona. In other words, free will. We have the free will to choose to honor God or not honor God. Do you agree that, with that statement? Do you know that? Amen? Yes. And angels were made that way because God himself has a free will. He made creatures with free will, right? Cre Creatures meaning the creatures with character or persona. So that, that is referring to angels and that is humans in the body, uh, spiritual beings in the bodies that are humans. So the angels had been given uh, the choice, the choice to obey or not obey, the choice to revere God or not, the choice to serve God or not. That is the perfection of the creature that God placed and that God demands. So these are sort of contradicting. On the one hand, there's no creature that's perfect. Agreed? Agreed? Amen. Yet, however, there is the perfection of creation that God demands, which is to use one's free, right, free, free um, uh, will or one's right to choose to serve God or not. And this angel, for a while, it seems like he was walking blamelessly, in God's way, according to God's will, he was serving God humbly until wickedness was found. So we're talking about Luciel, one day then called Lucifer because he challenged the throne of God, the name of God, as Isaiah 14, 12 on describes, and became the origin of sin. Do you understand so far? Logo students tell yep, I got that. Amen. So this is the snake or the serpent who came in the Garden of Eden and tempted the ancestor of all men to sin the same. And that is to challenge God, to disobey God. And, he, and, and what he did as, serp, as a serpent is that by then he is not only Satan, the enemy of God, but he is the devil who comes between God, the perfect God, and the creature who's supposed to use his perfection to obey and follow and serve. Instead... Our ancestor Adam wanted to be like God. I know I'm kind of going swap and some of you are going like, whoa, I'm a little like dizzy because you're going out of order. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. I'm just bringing Adam a little bit later. So we're talking about this uh, creature who misused his free will. This angel who is now called Satan coming between God and man. He is called the devil. Say with me, Satan. Satan. The devil. Right? So he comes between uh, man and, and God and tempted man, the ancestor of mankind. What's his name? Adam, the living being, and do the same, which is to reject the word of God and misuse his free will as he wished and, and cause him to take the forbidden fruit. So all men became under 
this angel, the devil, to now follow him in his ways and, and ultimately be thrown into hell. That's the punishment for sin. So um, was this a shock to God? Of course not. God is the one who gave that perfection to creatures in the beginning. So just like machines break down, you know, machines do break down. Although I get shocked. Every time something breaks, I'm like, how come this is broken? I'm going, of course it's supposed to be broken. Like, we just bought this fridge like five years ago. Why is it breaking down? Because it's not supposed to last forever. Hello, nothing lasts forever, right? Um, so creatures are not supposed to be this uh, blameless, uh, starting with the angels. Eventually, wickedness will surface. And that's according to um, God's um, plan. Now, according to his plan, he called the people of Israel through Moses and led them out of their slavery in Egypt and gave them the commandments to obey. The commandments, many commandments, or starting with the Ten Commandments, and there are hundreds of more. Deuteronomy 18.13 says, basically says, be blameless before the Lord. What does it say? Be blameless before the Lord. Because the Lord is perfect. Because the Lord is perfect, you ought to be perfect. Even though no creature can be perfect, that's what the law demanded. So the tabernacle they, they built, the sanctuary is called the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the desert, and then later the temple of Jerusalem. The sanctuary was where the stone tablets were placed inside the ark, and the name of the Lord Jehovah was there. So the people of Israel... Um, following the ark and the desert times and later um, settling in the promised land, the land of Canaan, they saw the temple and they remember the promise of God. And the promise of God was this. According to um, Psalm 119 verse 1, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. First of all, the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19 verse says. So God, the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Therefore, if you walk according to the law, uh, the, the, law, the law of the Lord, then you will be called perfect. You will be called blameless. And Proverbs 21 says, the blameless will dwell and remain in the promised land. So do you think the people of Israel try their best to keep the law, to obey the law and be perfect before the perfect God? They did. They tried. They tried. But eventually... Um, they compromised their faith. Um, they started worshiping Gentile gods. And because of their arrogance, they became stiff-necked. You wonder why he keeps on saying stiff-necked. Stiff-necked is someone who does not bow his head to the perfect one. Meaning, he thinks he's perfect. I'm good enough. I've done this long enough. I got this. I got this. So they become stiff-necked and they stop obeying and walking blamelessly. And in the end, their people, nation, uh, was destroyed as a result. But that was all within the process of God doing his work according to his schedule. And finally, when it was time, God sent his son in the name of the father. And he came in the name, therefore, Yeshua. And standing before the temple of Jerusalem, what did he say? Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. So he spoke in front of the Pharisees, who are the Jewish leaders and teachers of the law, who took pride in the fact that they were perfect abiders. They kept the law perfectly. Again, how many commandments are there? 613 to be exact. 613. Every single day of your life, they kept. Wow. I can't imagine. It's like, wow, how do you live? But they, they did. So that you could imagine how big their heads Head must have been, right? So they're so proud. And they honor the temple because the temple was where the, the name of the perfect God was, Jehovah. And the, the law of the perfect God, who is also perfect, was there. So a mere creature in the eyes of men, Yeshua was just a, a man, a creature, saying destroy the temple. This was unacceptable. It angered the Jew, uh, those Jewish leaders and wanted to put him to death as a result. But what he was referring to, what Yeshua was referring to was the temple of his body. He is saying that I'm going to die, but in three days, what's going to happen? I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to resurrect. And through that, I'm going to show you that it is not by the love of Jehovah that you will be made perfect, but that it will be through the command of the Father who alone is perfect. As he said in Matthew 5, 48, for your heavenly Father is, for your heavenly Father is perfect, right? So he alone is perfect. His word alone is perfect. Of course, God is the one who gave the law to the people of Israel, but it was just a shadow because he gave them in, not in the name of Yeshua, but in the name of Jehovah. So that was until the fulfillment of this moment of leading up to his death. So here's Yeshua saying, I will obey the command of the Father to death. 
and I will do it with a perfect heart. And a perfect heart as the Son of God. And he will carry this out in the temple. Um, now, in Psalm 101, verse 2, uh, in the NIV, it says slightly different. But in the New King James, it says, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Or, oh, when you, will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So, again, he said, it, the, the, the psalm says, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. What do you think that prophecy is about? Who are we talking about? The perfect way with the perfect heart in my house. Who are we talking about? The son of God who came as man. He will show and do in a perfect way. Because he alone is perfect. Amen? Let's go to John 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in. So who was with God in the beginning there? Who are we talking about? It's not God was with God in the beginning. Right? It's the word. There you go. The word. And the word is capitalized. Because we're not talking about sound words but we're talking about the word as a person and this word was god it says but it says the word was with god so you have like how many gods are there there's only one god but there are three persons to one god right so we already see a glimpse of how god will god will work as a trinity so the word who was with god is a part of god who would be manifested who would be revealed so who's god god is perfect God is perfect. And when he called on the people of Israel, he demanded them to be perfect by giving them the law. But in reality, even as they try, no one can be perfect because God alone is perfect. Um, but here is God who is perfect in the beginning as in eternity, he was perfect. But then he decided to be the word and that word had planned to be revealed, revealed as man. So let's go to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the father. Full of grace and truth. He came from the father and the father is who? He is perfect. Coming from him, the son is also perfect. Because his nature is that he is God, the perfect one. If you understand, say amen. Amen. So he is the perfect God who came as men, but in the eyes of men around him, they could not accept him as perfect. He's just human like everyone else, right? But here's another uh, prophecy, Micah. If you will go there, Micah. Micah chapter 6. Find Micah in the Old Testament and go to chapter 6, verse 9. Micah. <coughs> So that prophecy in Psalm 101 is about him uh, behaving in a perfect way within his house. He will do it with perfect heart. And here's Micah 6, 9 saying, listen, the Lord is calling to the city and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. So here is prophecy. It sounds really difficult to understand, but if you break it apart, like to fear his name is wisdom. To fear, to revere, to honor him is wisdom. Because one has the choice to do so. You choose to fear him. And that will be your wisdom. And you choose, take, choose to take the rod. What's the rod? What, what, what is the rod used for? The rod is used for beating. So someone's going to take the beating. Someone's going to take the beating of God. But he will do it willingly. He will choose to do it because he is given the perfection, perfection of God. And that is to have the free will, the choice to take the beating. Who is Micah? Who, who was Micah speaking of? Speaking of the word who became flesh, the perfect God who was with God in the beginning. The perfect one was with God in the beginning as the word becoming flesh. Coming as the son of God, the son of man in the name of Yeshua. Hallelujah. This tells us that it was within the plan of God that the son would come and suffer to death. And that it was for his choice. It was by his choice. And that was using and being that perfect, like a creature, though he's not a creature. John 1, 3 says, it is through him all things were made. 
He is actually the creator. Yeshua is the creator who created all things. All things. But when he came into the world like man, in the flesh of man, he will come like a creature. In the eyes of man, he will become like the creator. Created. And like the created, he would use the perfection. He would show that he is perfect. That he would uh, give that perfection that's demanded from the creatures. And that is by using his free will to take the rod, the beating, the suffering planned for him according to the Father's will. Isn't that amazing? That interpretation according to the will of God is that. To understand this, how his suffering and death was already planned. So he came in the weakness of man. Let's also go to Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are. Yet he did not. Sin. So if you're reading from the NIV, as I quoted here, yet he did not sin. But early translation or the different translation like uh, New King James or ESV, they will say yet without sin. Though he is without sin. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says he who knows no sin. How come he knows no sin? How come he has no sin? How come he is without sin? Is it because he has great strength and that free will? And he has willpower? He says no. Is that why he's without sin? Yes? What are you? You don't say yes or no. You're just kind of frozen. I'm just going to stay still and you won't notice. Huh? I notice every one of you not doing anything. Why does it say he's without sin? Who is he? Because he is? Because he is? God without sin. Hallelujah. God is above the law, above sin, above all. He alone is without sin. And we just read in John 1.1. 1, 1, he is, he is God without sin. Knows no sin. Became flesh. His flesh is the word. His flesh is the spirit. Amen? So he knows no sin. Though he came, even though he is, without, he is God without sin, he came in the weakness, it says, to sympathize or empathize with our weaknesses. He came in the weakness of the flesh. Because it says we have, um, we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, just as we are. Many people interpret that and say, oh, see, look at that. Jesus is also tempted like us. Yeah. He has lust like us. He just presses it down. He controls it. So that's why he's without sin. That is a very common misinterpretation. Misinterpretation. Because the makeup of his flesh is not the makeup of my flesh or your flesh. What is his flesh again? His flesh is? His flesh is what? What became flesh? Blank became flesh? The word who was God. The word who was the perfect God in the beginning became flesh. He became flesh visibly same as us. Functionally same as us. When he does not eat, he's hungry. So he fasted for 40 days. Was he hungry or not? You don't think he was hungry? He didn't eat for 40 days. So he was hungry. So that's why the devil showed up. And what did he say? If you are the son of God, uh -huh, then tell these stones to turn into bread. Yeah, you're right. I'm so hungry. Stones turn to bread. Did he do that? That's why the devil's saying, he's like, oh, you say you're the son of God. Let's see you be mighty. Let's see you be able. Let's see, show me your might, your power. But he was not tempted because he is God. Hallelujah. Though he knew hunger and his, uh, he knew exhaustion and weakness of the flesh, he did not sin because he cannot sin. In Luke 13, 32, um, Yeshua had said to the disciples, Go tell the fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform curses today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I... It says uh, in NIV, I, reach, I will reach my goal, but in other translations, I shall be perfected. Do you remember how I d we defined the word perfect? It means to reach goal. Teleoi, like telescope, reach goal. So same idea. So he's saying on the third day, I will reach my goal. In other words, I shall be made perfect on the third day. Meaning he has come. He has come to die. And on the third day, meaning his third year, so the three years of his perfect life, and the third year after his baptism, he will die. But only after his death, he will be made perfect, referring to his resurrection. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. You're getting a lot of information here. Yes? To, I want to share with you how perfect the Bible is. 
how the word of God is perfect. And we cannot deny, therefore, who Yeshua is, that he is the perfect God, though he came in the weakness of flesh. And there is purpose of him coming in the weakness of flesh. In his time, nobody believed him to be who he is, that he was sent by the perfect God, therefore he's the son of the perfect God. Because in the eyes of the Pharisees who kept the law and prided themselves for being perfect law abiders, Yeshua was just a sinner because they accused him of breaking the law. For example, breaking Sabbath. John 9, 16, they said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Wow, Yeshua didn't keep the Sabbath, even though he is God and who commanded keep the Sabbath to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. What was he doing on the Sabbath? Healing. Healing. He was healing. But even that, they could not tolerate. They had to find something to, to accuse him. So they said, see, you're working. You're making this other man wo wo work by picking up his mat. So they accused him of being a sinner, but it was Yeshua coming as uh, in the weakness of flesh for the perfect will of the Father, and that was to fulfill the law and the prophets. To fulfill what? The law and the prophets. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, or to perfect them, to make them perfect. So the law and the prophets, what do they make up? The Old Testament. The Old Testament, in two words, are, or two things, are what? The law and the prophets. That's the summary of the Old Testament. So he came to fulfill them. Wait a minute. But isn't the law of the Lord perfect? Right? That was the lesson of the Old Testament. The Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Yes? If it was perfect, however, he did not have to come and say, I have come to fulfill it. Hmm. So what, what did he come to perfect? What is the demand? What is the requirement of the law? The law that is also referred to as the law of sin and death. The law of condemnation. What does the law demand? First of all, the law defines sin. And it condemns sinners. And it demands what from sinners? The price of sin. Say it with me. The price of sin? The price of sin? Death. Sinners must die. That's what the law says. And in fact, that's why sinners were killed, put to death, put to death. But at the same time, we see prophecy that's to be fulfilled. Like Isaiah, for example, 53, talking about someone who will die as an atoning sacrifice, like a sheep laying down its life for the sinners. And that's exactly what they did according to the law for them to live, for the sinner to live. So on the one hand, the law says the price of sin is death. Sinners must die. The prophets, through the prophets, he says, someone is coming to become an atoning sacrifice for sinners of the world, the Lamb of God. And he had in fact come that through his one-time death, he would make the law and the prophets perfect, fulfill them all. Amen. So only through the, his death, this will come true. So that's why when men came to arrest him, he did not resist. He did not perform any signs. He did not show his power, but he became seemingly powerless like a sheep led to its slaughter and he laid down his life but the moment of his death was the moment he was laying down his life willingly john 10 18 says i lay down my life willingly not that anyone takes it away from me but this is according to the command of the father he was given the choice will you obey the command of the father and he said yes john 12 50 says i know that the father's command leads to eternal life and I will lay down my life willingly and that's why he said it is finished he kept the father's command because he is the only blameless one before the blameless God in his blameless way in his perfect way with his perfect heart what is the perfect heart humble God revering heart if you revere God if you fear God say amen what does it mean to fear God? It's to lay yourself down. Because God alone is perfect. It's to surrender myself and say, I'm nothing. I'm not perfect. God, you alone are perfect. Now, wait a minute. Isn't Jesus God? I've been telling you all along that he is God. Yes, he is God, the perfect God. However, when he came as man and called himself the son of man because he came in the weakness of the flesh, he came into the world that he himself created like a creature. And the only thing the creature can do, in fact, the perfect thing that creature can do, what is it? To use his 
free will to do what? To surrender, to obey to death, to revere God, to fear God. That's what the Son of God did. He laid down his life perfectly and declared, Father, you alone are the perfect one. Even though he is God himself. Do you understand? In the weakness of the flesh, he used his body so that he would give his perfect life to the perfect God. And Psalm 26 one says, vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord, have not faltered. Blameless life. Blameless life is to surrender one's life before the creator, the perfect God, the father. And through his obedience to death, what he did was he condemned the devil, the angel who ignored this perfection of the creator to use his free will to obey, but misused it. Yeshua, through his perfect obedience, condemned the disobedient one. And he laid down his life and paid the price of the sin of all men. Hallelujah. His death was to replace mine, uh, me, the sinner. He became sin for us, even though he knows no sin, to pay the price of sin. And he shed his precious blood. That blood is precious, described to be precious. First Peter 1, 18 to 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect remember the definition of perfect no flaw no spot no lacking no fault nothing wrong with it so his blood is called precious blood because he is the perfect god his blood is the perfect blood of the perfect god what do you say he sprinkled that blood for the souls of all men to receive so that in time when they hear the good news like you and me can have him know him as the perfect redeemer and receive his blood hallelujah now when he had died yeshua died as that perfect sacrifice given not for humans, for God, in service of God, he became three things in fulfilling the three components of serving God. That is, as a high priest, he died, as a tabernacle in the place where one serves God, and as the offering itself, he became, he served the perfect God. So let's look at the Bible a little bit together. Let's go to Hebrews um, 10, 1. So you're going to stay in Hebrews, and we're going to look at some passages to understand how the book of Hebrews explains Yeshua to be the perfect one. Hebrews 10, 1. Together. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Again, the book of Hebrews, like you have to know the Old Testament and to put them together and compare side by side, the Old Testament, the law, and the gospel, and which is just about Yeshua himself. So you compare the two, and what it's saying is the law of the Old Testament is only a shadow. And the people in, under that law in the Old Testament, they followed the law to serve God. And they, gave, they did it year after year, and they gave animal sacrifice in the man-made space called the tabernacle or the temple. And they did it through human priest. So they would do it through the human priest. The sinners will bring sacrifice, animal, and give it to the human priest. And human priest will bring it to the physical, material, man-made space called the tabernacle, the temple. Comparing that, if that had been perfectly given to God, although God commanded the Israelites to do this and they obeyed, if that all that process was perfect, then they did not have to keep on doing it year after year. So what it means is it was imperfect. It was not perfect. Even though in the Old Testament, the law of the Lord is perfect. It was not perfect. It's only a shadow of the true, come, true thing to come. So go to chapter 7, which talks about the priesthood, the imperfection of the uh, human priesthood uh, compared to the priest, the perfect high priest of Jesus that he is. Hebrews uh, 7, 1, 2, 3. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, the priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So Melchizedek is the king of Salem who appears in Genesis, uh, whom... 
Abraham meets after he wins a battle, and then Abraham gives a tenth of his plunder uh, and, 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 and uh, bows before him. And what Hebrews is saying is that king, uh, the king of peace to whom Abraham gave, is actually God, specifically Yeshua. That Yeshua is this king of uh, peace who has come because he's without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. He is the son of God who is the priest forever. Continue verse 11, 11 to 12. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. So it's saying that if that human priesthood was perfect, why does the prophecy, uh, prophecy say, the words say that there's a priest to come? There's a perfect one to come. Verse 26 says, such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law points as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law pointed the son who has been made perfect forever. If you know the Old Testament, you know how these priests were selected. Highly, highly selected. You cannot apply for a job just because you want to. You have to come from the line of Levi, and not just all any Levi, but you have to come from the line of Aaron. So only from there, and again, not everyone was accepted. You had to go through this process of selection. Physically, you have to be flawless, and you have to be consecrated, and all this process, you're selected to serve God as priest, and then there's high priest. That is a lifetime appointment. So you can think of the selection of priests like selected, selected, selected. Even so, however, when they went before God to serve God on behalf of the people, they had to first give sacrifice their own sins. Because even priests are sinners. Because priests are humans. So they're sinners and they also die. So they couldn't continue serving God to be a witness for someone else's atonement. So that made human priesthood imperfect. But what Hebrews is saying, but we have this high priest who truly meets our need. Who alone is holy, blameless, pure. In other words, who alone is perfect. Hallelujah. Who is that about? It's about Yeshua. Hallelujah. Go to the chapter, uh, chapter 9. Hebrews 9, 9 to 11 says what? This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation. Certainly, he, Yeshua, when he served the Father God through his death, he obeyed the command of the Father. He, as the high priest, went before the perfect holy God, and he would enter the heavenly tabernacle that is heaven outside the universe. But also represents that tabernacle that is not made by hands is referring to his body. Remember he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Referring to what? The temple of his body. That temple is not made by hands. That is not of this world. Because that body is spirit. That body is the word. So those who will come to him later on to worship him, people like us, believers, souls born again in his blood, will come through him, by him, by, his, uh, uh, by having him as a high priest went before us, and his body is the temple, that we also will come to worship him that way. So, and, and finally, uh, Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by... Look at that together, 1014. Now we have, so we have covered the high priest, uh, tabernacle, and then third element of service, which is offering, sacrifice. 1014, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So by one sacrifice refers to his own body, his blood. By his perfect, precious blood, he has made perfect those who will receive his blood to become holy. Also perfect. Hallelujah. So again, once again, who is Yeshua? He is the perfect high priest. Perfect 
tabernacle. Perfect sacrifice. Again, once again, with your neighbor. Who is Yeshua? How did he serve the Father? As the perfect. So he is the perfect high priest, perfect tabernacle, perfect sacrifice. There, so we, we, we summarize. So he is the perfect God who was in the beginning. And he became flesh and came in the weakness of the flesh. It was for him to lay down his life. And through his uh, death, he honored, revered the father to be the only perfect one. And he gave that perfect, blameless sacrifice. Perfect uh, and blameless service for the perfect God. As he became the perfect high priest, perfect tabernacle, perfect sacrifice. And by shedding his precious blood. And that was solely for those who will believe him later on. To be received so that we may go unto perfection. To go before the perfect God and serve him forever. Hallelujah. That is what he accomplished when he died. And he, therefore his obedience to death was perfection. To reach perfection. To surrender totally before the word of God. That's what it means. He set the, the bar supremely high. But because he achieved it, just as he said in three days after his death, he resurrected. How many of you believe that Yeshua resurrected? And he was then revealed to be the perfect one, revealing in the body through his bodily resurrection. In his body, he showed what perfection is. And he entered that spiritual heaven, the heavenly tabernacle, sat down at the right hand of God, where he receives glory and honor and power and praise forever and ever. It's from that throne in heaven, the Holy Spirit was sent in the name of the perfect God, Yeshua. And it is in that name name souls like us have heard the good news the good news of our perfect God laying down his life and shedding his precious blood for us and by calling on that name of Yeshua we have received the perfect blood of Yeshua and have been made perfect in our souls how many of you believe that that you have been made your soul has been made perfect by the perfect blood of Yeshua amen so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6, Paul is writing to the Christians and he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, the message of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. And he is saying, I am speaking among the mature. He uses the word mature. It's translated in English mature, but same Greek word for perfect, teleosis, teleosis. So those who have reached their goal, they have mature, have become completed is what I'm, I, where I'm speaking or what I'm uh, uh, putting effort to do in the church. So even though my flesh is still a long way from perfection, even in the world, there's nothing perfect at all, at all. And in fact, the entire world is perishing. As we talked about last night too, with the, the, the signs of end times, the climate change, the increase of crime and poverty and all the entire planet is actually declining. The solar system is declining and it's just coming going, driving, it's being driven towards the end of things. So there is nothing perfect in the world. All the more, there's one thing that in the eyes of God that is perfect. And that is my soul because of the blood of the perfect one. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Do you believe your soul has been made perfect? Look at your neighbor and say, your soul has been made perfect. Why do you have that weird face on? I, he's not perfect. No way. She doesn't even put some makeup on. Yeah. You don't look perfect at all. I'm sorry. These lines just live with me. But ask me next week. It's going to be a different play. Okay. So it's in the eyes of God. Nobody's perfect. Physically, certainly, and character wise. In no way am I perfect yet. Spiritually, I'm 100% made perfect. And it's not my doing at all. It's by the grace of God and by the grace of God alone that I, the soul, have been made holy. Hallelujah. However, the Holy Spirit came not to just leave us in that state and say, that's good. You're perfect. Mm -mm. The Holy Spirit had came and Colossians 1.28 says, he's the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature, meaning to present everyone perfect in Christ. The Holy Spirit has come and gathered the believers in the name of Yeshua as the church. That's right. That's what the church does. 
What does the church do? The church calls and gathers, and to those who are gathered, who have been made perfect in the soul, in the spirit, by the blood of Yeshua, to not just share the mind and say, you are perfect, don't change. Let nothing, you don't need to change a thing about you. It's a lie. I mean, you can say that about another person because you're so in love with someone. You're perfect in every way. Yeah, okay. So let's wait. Let's wait a couple years. No, not even a couple years. A couple months. No, not even a couple months. So give it a couple of hours and you'll find out. Because nobody's perfect. So the church is the place where we are called by the Holy Spirit, gathered by the Holy Spirit. And this is in the church where we are being ready to be presented to the perfect Lord, perfect God, Yeshua, our King, to be presented as perfect and blameless. What the church then does is admonish and teach. What does the word admonish mean? What does it mean? To rebuke, to reprimand. Oh, I see. I get it. It's, it's not, however, to abuse someone and, and, and in, uh, offend someone or insult someone for some evil intent. Rather, it's for one to mature. Remember the rod, heed to the rod, heed the rod, heed to the rod. So heed, 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 give in, surrender to the rod. That rod, to that rod, which is the word of the Father, the Son of God, Yeshua, who is God himself in his nature, laid down his life perfectly. And that in the eyes of God says, that is the perfection that I demand from the creator. Create creation. The, the demand of the creator from the creatures or creation is that perfection, which is to heed to the rod. And that is to be admonished, reprimanded by the word. Why do I need to be reprimanded? Nobody tells me what to do. I'm rebel. I live my free life. That's why I ran away from my parents. I'm free. I'm independent. Now I'm brought into church and being told what to do. Man, this, I, this, I did not sign up for this. I did not sign up for this. In the beginning, people keep on coming with no pressure because people keep on buying you food. We give you free bagel. We give you coffee. And come, come Wednesday, free food, free food. Yeah. And even after Sunday, free food. I mean, you stick around long enough, you'll get your three meals taken care of in the church. So people like it. In the beginning, everyone's nice, smiling. But after a while, are you coming? How come you didn't come? And then you missed one Sunday. Everyone's looking at you like, like you're, you're like plagued. Like, oh, God. What, ha what happened to you? Where were you? Where were you? Then they're like, I feel pressure. Oh, I don't know about this. I need to think about this. I did not sign up for this. But the church is the place where we're being admonished because we need to mature. How many of us can boldly say, I have matured fully? I have obtained the maturity of Christ. How many of, can, of us can say that? Even if you may be a mother or a grandmother. Or even great grandmother or great grandfather. Doesn't matter what your physical age says. Spiritually, you still may be a very mature person. So it's in, in the spirit. Um, so back up. Let me clarify. Spirit is, ha, has been made perfect by the blood of Yeshua. But my soul, as in the character, including the character, has continued to change. And it starts with my character, then my life starts to change. So what the Holy Spirit does to the church is to cause the believers, to lead the believers to become saints. As in to go through this process of perseverance to mature from seed to crop. So from seed, for it to go from seed to crop, it has to go through a long period of waiting and harsh winter and harsh weather. And waiting and waiting and waiting so that it can finally bear fruit. And that bearing fruit through the process of working and serving. So Ephesians 4.12 says being equipped. What the church does is equipping the saints for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. If we want to go before the perfect God and be in his perfect environment. How many, how many of you want to be there? How many of you want to go there? Amen? I think I only have 60% of the room. You're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go there. You know what your option, your plan B is the other place. The other place. That is so, so far from perfection called hell. 
Yeah, once again, how many of you want to go before the perfect God and be in his perfect environment, serving him face to face forever? Amen. I want to go there. And if I want to go there, then I need to belong to the, bo- the church as members of his body. And it is where I am admonished and taught. As Yeshua said, go and make disciples of all nations, teach, t- o- baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teaching them to obey. Teaching them to live according to the way. The perfect way. The blameless way. But this is where a lot of people have trouble. They say, I don't want to be told what to do. It's a free country. Yeah, it is free country. Free country, yes. And it is by your choice that you come. It is by your choice that you decide to receive Yeshua's blood. And obey his command by being baptized in his name. Say amen if you have been baptized in the name of Yeshua. Did anyone force you? Did I push you into the water? Some of you pulled me into the water with you because you're so much bigger than me. So I never pushed you. You went, you went, uh, you were by your choice. You used the perfection. You were, you revealed the perfection of the, of, of a creature that you are by using your choice. The problem is when you come out of the water. Come out of the water. My old self is dead and now I must live the blameless life, blameless way of my blameless king, the perfect king, Yeshua. But as you walk and walk and you forget who you are and then you realize you're good enough. I don't need to be told what to do. What do people tell me what to do? I've been here longer than they have. So why, why, why do I have to follow them? Or why do I have to be serving them? Why do I need to be taught by them? I'm good enough. And what's the pastor yelling at me for? I mean, it may sound yelling. It may sound criticizing. But I want you to kind of think about a coach. Right? A coach. And people pay money for coaching for everything. Anything and everything. You have money, you can buy any kind of coach. Coach to help you. Investment coach to play the piano. Coach to play uh, kick a ball better or shoot, shoot a ball better than anyone else. And hit a ball better than anyone else. Like you could hire a coach to speak better. You could hire a coach to date. Date. Yeah, dating coach. You can have a coach to play games and gamble better. Oh my God, there's so many coaches. So if you think about a coach like that and how people give, if the coach is saying, you know, your left hand is like a lagging, your leg is a little bit slow and bent the wrong way. Your foot is landing on in the wrong angle. You don't go, how dare you tell me? Why are you tell me that? How many of us, I mean, how many of you are going to react that way? You, oh yeah, right. You're right. You're right. I got to fix my arm, fix my leg. I got to turn my face differently. My chest has to be out. And I got to do this and that. You take it all because it's all for your gain. But then when you're hearing it, and as the word is written in the Bible, and you're taught how to live, don't do this, don't do that. No, you have to humble yourself and obey and show up. Show up. Show up. And even then people don't listen because they say, it's my choice, free country. We have. We still have a long way to go. When the... When the Lord comes back and he is coming back. How many of you really believe that the Lord is coming back? The one who fulfilled the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. He ascended to heaven. Only one last promise that is remaining is his return. And when he returns, he's not coming as a redeemer or savior of the world. He's coming as the judge, the king of kings who deserves nothing better than wheat. The perfect crop. That's it. Not 70%, not 50%, but 100% mature. Only those he will take. So anyone who's still complaining, who's questioning, do I have to keep on doing this? Man, there's so many other churches then. They do good, good work and they don't get yelled at. They don't get pushed. The reason why we're being admonished and pressed And nurtured, even in at times painful ways, in the body of Christ or the Holy Spirit, is that we have received this command to be perfect. To be perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be complete. That's another word for it. Be complete. Be mature. If you're thinking you're already mature, by definition, you're immature. As Paul himself said, my great... The Lord, he, has, he, had, he had said in 2 Corinthians 12, not, uh, 12 there, he's talking about thorn in his body. So it sounds like he was dealing with sickness and he had been praying for healing, but the Lord did not answer his prayer. And then it says in chapter 12, 9, he says, the Lord spoke to Paul and said, my grace is sufficient for you. 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul, reading that, you can see, was truly a mature one. So even his hardship, he did not complain. He did not doubt. He accepted the hardship and the suffering. And he said, this is how the power of Christ is revealed through my weakness. And therefore, I will let his power be shown through my weak body. So for us to be found as the mature and be taken up when the Lord comes back. As those who know themselves as Christians who have received this perfect law that gives freedom. The perfect law that does not oppress, that does not condemn. And that is called the gospel. If we have received the gospel, the perfect law that gives us freedom. We have received the command to be perfect. Therefore, we must strive to be perfect by putting faith into action. So 2 Corinthians 13 lets us strive for full restoration, but also be complete is another translation. And that's, there's use a different Greek word for that, but same idea. Be complete. We're given the word to be complete. And James reminds us in 125, whoever looks intently in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they had heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So, if you have received this perfect law and you're striving to be perfect in the eyes of the Lord according to his way, then you do not forget what you have heard. But you put into action, put into practice, which means you need to obey. Yes, the bottom line is the same. But I'm explaining it differently according to one aspect of who God is. Because our Heavenly Father is perfect, he demands perfect from us. And how can I be perfect when I know I'm so flawed? That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit came. But it is by the power of the Holy Spirit, Yeshua himself lived his life to be blameless, successfully, and was obedient to death. So the same power is at work in our bodies, in our lives. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit is with us. So what is a Christian uh, supposed to do? As Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fix your eyes on the Lord, the perfecter of faith, Yeshua. Fix your eyes on the Lord. Amen. Don't fix your eyes on others because those eyes will cause you to judge others. I, I am, I'm perfect. What's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? I come to all the meetings and you don't. That's why we have to be in the place of the mature one. To take care of the immature and mature ring ones. Patiently. There's requirement of patience. Patience. Patience until when? Just as the Lord has been patient with you. You need to show even a fraction of patience for your brothers. Perseverance is what is required. By persevering, we may produce crop. Luke 8, 14 to 15 just talks about the parable of seeds. The way the seed will become a crop is through perseverance. For me to become mature, I need to persevere. I need to be patient for the fruit to come to perfection. I need to wait. I need to be patient with one another. With, with in time, I do not give up. Secondly, because the Father is perfect. The Father God is perfect. I need to be perfect as in showing the love of the perfect Father to one another. In Matthew 19, 21, to the young wealthy man, Jesus said, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. You want to be perfect? You have to lay down what's precious to you. Without laying down, what is precious to you, you don't come to the perfect father. Colossians 3.14 says, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is perfection. And because he has shown us his perfect love, we have to put every effort to strive to have that love for one another. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So if you're still holding grudges against another and judging one another, you are not perfect. You're not mature. You're not complete. I have to therefore shed all my imperfect ways and judgy ways. 
holding grudges and unforgiving, cold-hearted. With that in place, I cannot go to the perfect one. And finally, I have to do everything I can to fulfill the perfect will of the Father. What is the will of the Father given to me as I pray? Let your will be done in my life as it was done in heaven. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that prayer about? As Yeshua said in John 6, 38 to 40, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those who has, he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Verse 40, it says, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Romans 12, 2 says, God's will is good pleasing and perfect his will is perfect amen his will is perfect amen and i have to put effort and i have to commit that the daily bread i take the food i take as you said my food is to do the will of him who sent me that the reason i need to eat today the reason why i'm eating today the reason why i need to go and and make earning and go to go to work and pay for my food or the daily uh food for the daily bread that's been promised to me, I need to do that through my livelihood, is to do the will of the Father. It's no longer for myself and my family and to become greedy and be ambitious in the world and accrue my positions in the world. No, it's not that anymore. It is to be spent to do His will. Amen? But how many of you are really doing that? Fulfilling the will, the perfect will of God is to raise to life those souls given to me, to not give up on them, to, to save them, to do all that I can to serve them. And as needed, if they are in need, I'm supposed to provide for their physical needs as well. That's why we are talking about these relief work too. And sometimes, yes, it is providing for those who do not even believe. They're not even my brothers in Christ. But in the name of the perfect God, I must show the perfect love that at least one of those souls, even at the least one soul, may change his heart. Change his heart and turn his heart to the Lord and be saved. That's the effort that we make. So to be perfect. How can I be perfect? James, when you read the book of James, and I do suggest that you go home and read the book of James because it is quite scary and disheartening. Because when you read something like chapter 3, it talks about taming the tongue. With one tongue, you praise the Lord and you curse at the same time. You praise the Lord with the one tongue, you criticize your brothers. You judge others. And you, 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 you offend and insult others. Words of hatred and judgment. So how can with one tongue, men can say, I praise the Lord, I love the Lord, and then I hate you, brother. I'm mad at you. I'm judging you. I'm holding grudges against you. Complaining. There are some people like that. I hear that. And I, I mean, they go, amen, and walk around. And say, as soon as we say amen, walk out, it's like just not even 10 minutes ago, but the only thing you hear is complain, complain, complain. Be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Be perfect in your words. And I'm, yes, I'm guilty, number one. That's why I beat my chest and repent. Just these words just roll on. Some people say, well, that's why I don't speak at all, pastor. <laughs> I let you people do all the talk and I just sit there quiet. And what do they do? They judge. They judge in silence. And going, you fool. That's why I'm not talking. Because you're talking, you're revealing that you're full. It's a little more, and then their own talk, so I have to talk more. Because they're not talking. And the more I talk, the more mistake I make. Oh, man. And more repentance. No one is perfect. This is why we need to pray. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? If you don't pray, you're saying that I'm done, I'm perfect, I'm mature. Oh, no, that's not true. It's because I'm lazy. There you go. That's why you're not praying. The reason why we're praying is not because we're perfect. The reason why we're telling you to pray is not because we're perfect. The reason why we're telling you to pray is because we're imperfect. And we need to go on to perfection. When the Lord comes back, he does not want to do anything to do with half-filled fruit. He doesn't have anything to do with chaff. He's perfect to go to his perfect house and dwell in his perfect place. We have to be perfect. So what to do? When I worship him, I'm not imperfect, so is he going to receive my worship? When I praise him, 
It's not like that you're singing perfectly, the Lord is being praised. Or that my giving, or maybe you could say like, well, I'm a really good actor. Or like, I can do a lot of, I'm really an artist and I'm very artistic. I could do really perfect work. Therefore, he's going to receive. Absolutely not. There's nothing that I can do to be received as the perfect one. Yes, my, my spirit, the spirit has been made perfect by his perfect blood. But my character, my character, the soul that I am, right? Character plus the spirit. I'm talking about the soul. I'm full of flaws. I'm full of mistakes, full of regrets, therefore. The only thing that I have as my perfection is the blood of Yeshua. Wouldn't you say? Amen? So what does that mean? As I'm giving my dedication, how can I say, and then you say, oh, phew, I'm glad I'm, I finished it. I want you to examine, have I given perfect dedication? Am I giving per perfect dedication? What does that mean? It is to surrender entirely, totally before the perfect God and saying, I have no perfection in me at all. The only perfection that I can put forth, put before me and hide in it and be shielded by it and be covered by it is the perfect blood of God. That's my only qualification. That's my only righteousness, my only holiness, my only perfection I have. So I cling onto the blood and say, cover me with your blood. Your blood alone is what makes me perfect. And I want to be like you. To go on to perfection. To meet you. To meet you. The more we know who we, the more we know God, and he, the more we know Yeshua, he becomes greater and bigger and bigger, and I become less and less. I become smaller and smaller, more flawed than ever. So what can I do? How can I close this gap? The gap becomes, gets bigger and bigger and bigger between the perfect God and the imperfect me. I must confess and seek and cry out. James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who generously gives to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Amen. This is why we must never give up on prayer. Prayer is the way, first of all, to confess that I'm imperfect before the perfect God. And prayer is the way that I seek his mercy to become perfect like him in my thinking, in my speaking, in my making decisions, whether I'm writing or speaking and moving and walking, that it is blameless in his eyes. And that's only possible through prayer when I'm surrendering myself before him. Do you agree? Amen. No matter how much money we give, how many hours we give, how much effort we make, we are still imperfect. But Lord, my desire is to see your face. To meet you face to face. I want to go before that perfection. So help me. That is our prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Jude one twenty four says. To him who is able. To keep you from stumbling. And to present you before his glorious presence. Without fault. And with great joy. The only one who is able to keep us. From falling. So that we are presented as perfect crop, complete fruit in full maturity is our Lord himself. Help me. Help us all. We want to go on to perfection and go before you. We cannot do it alone. Please help us. Help me. And let me be more like you, Yeshua. Yeshua.